So as you know, um, I spent a lot of my life doing camping ministry, and there was uh, uh, a, a phrase that we had in camping ministry, which was called, I want to make sure I don't want to trip over this, um, the mountaintop experience. And some of you perhaps have had this yourself. If you've gone away to camp or you've gone away, um, you've kind of gotten away from all of that, and you're in the midst of God's creation, and God just speaks to you, and you have an encounter um, with the living God, and we uh, we call that the, the mountaintop experience. Now, the ultimate mountaintop experience happened a long, long time ago, and it's a pivotal moment in the Gospels. We read about it in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's when uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to this mountaintop. And, and, and as the Gospel of Luke tells us, the disciples are kind of falling asleep because they just have a tendency to fall asleep. Even, I don't know what it is about the disciples. Like they just kind of, they're, they're, they're a little bit sleepy and they awaken. And there is Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah, some of these great, grand prophets. And they're talking to Jesus, Elijah and and Moses are talking to Jesus about his upcoming death. And Peter, of course, is rather perplexed by this because this is not Peter's plan. And Peter does not understand what it is that Jesus must do. And so Peter has this great idea and he says, let's build three booths. And you all can just stay here and we can enjoy this incredible moment where Jesus is radiant and the great prophets are there. But that is not God's plan because ministry and mission rarely takes place on the mountaintop, but it takes place in the valleys. This Lenten season, we're talking about how Jesus fulfills three offices, the office of prophet, priest, and king. Then when we look at the Old Testament, there were three offices in which people were ordained to, set aside for, anointed into, and that was the office of prophet, priest, and king. And so this morning, we want to talk about Jesus' role as prophet. And I want to have teed that up by this conversation where Jesus is with two of the most well-known prophets in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, what's interesting in the book of Deuteronomy, which as you may recall, is actually a sermon. Moses preaches this super long sermon to the people of Israel as they're getting ready to go into the promised land. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses foreshadows that which is to happen. And he says this, the Lord, your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Now, if you recall, at that Mount of Transfiguration, after Jesus has become radiant, God speaks, and God says, this is my son, the one whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And remember, the baptism of Jesus is just, this is my son whom I love. But at the Transfiguration, the, the, the ministry and the mission of Jesus is about to begin. And so God says, listen to him. It's about to begin because it's taking Jesus to Jerusalem. Now, what's interesting is Simon then, Simon Peter, has this encounter with Jesus as well as with the other prophets. And in Acts chapter 3, if you go there, we're not going to read that this morning. But if you look in Acts chapter 3, after Jesus or after Peter and John have healed a crippled man, Peter addresses the, the crowd and he alludes to the message of Moses about how a prophet must be raised up and how that prophet has been raised up and not raised up in the sense of simply being born, but having been raised up on a cross so that we might have abundant and everlasting life. And Peter, as you know, he continued to live, he continued to minister, he continued to hold on to this prophetic message that pointed people ultimately to Jesus, the message of the prophets. And so when we turn our attention over to 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm trying to build a case here, by the way, that we understand this prophetic role that appears not only in the Old Testament, but is also affirmed by the New Testament. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, so this is now the salvation that Christ has brought, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care. 
The prophets, those who have gone before, searched and with the greatest of care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. So Peter, as he addresses this congregation, after he has witnessed the transfiguration, he says, I want you to remember those Hebrew prophets, those Jewish prophets, those those prophets that we read about in the scriptures, and to understand something about them. They were trying to figure out when this Messiah was going to come. When would the Savior come? When would the liberation happen? And they talked about Valley of Dry Bones, and they talked about God's judgment, but they also pointed to a future day when all was going to be restored and when all was going to be reconciled. Those prophets told forth, spoke forth God's word. And when God's word goes forth, we need to listen to listen for God's word. So we're going to be reading in just a moment, I promise, from Luke chapter 7. That's where we're, that's our aim for this morning, and we're going to get there. I just had a long list of things I wanted to say before we got to Luke 7, because I want to build this understanding of the importance of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of all of the prophets. But what's interesting, before we get to Luke 7, we read in Luke 4, Jesus returns to Nazareth. And he opens up the scroll. You may recall when he opens up the scroll. I don't have this up on the screen. I'm just going to summarize it uh, for you all very briefly because you probably remember this. He opens up the scroll, and as he opens up the scroll, he turns to the book of Isaiah, and then he describes what it is that he is to be about and what it was that he was going to accomplish. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And what is the Spirit of the Lord going to have him do? He's been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, Proclaim freedom for the captives, give sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. So Jesus proclaims that in Luke 4, saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give sight. I'm going to bring healing. I'm going to give freedom. I'm going to proclaim this good news that will liberate the world ultimately. But then Jesus begins to act into it. It isn't simply just a word. It is the word in flesh. It is an enacted word. And as we make our way into Luke chapter 7, we see Jesus now with this ministry of healing, this ministry that we're going to read about of raising the dead. Now, as Luke 7 begins, it is a story of the centurion and the faith of the centurion. I'm actually preaching on this text in a couple of months, so I'm not going to talk about that other than to say that we see Jesus in action. We see a centurion. This is an amazing, you you all need to go and read this miracle. It's a very, I find it so encouraging and yet so strange because I just said I wasn't going to talk about it, right? It's just strange. Like Jesus never even meets the centurion. He just hears of the centurion and Jesus said, such faith I have not found in all of Israel. And then the centurion's servant is, is healed. Okay, you can look at that later or in a couple months when I preach about that. Our text this morning follows right after that story, the story of great faith. But I want you to listen in this story for the word faith, the story we're going to read, because you're not going to hear it. Here we go. Luke 7, verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nine, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, and when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier that, that they were carrying him on the stretcher, and the bearers stood still. He said, Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man got up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. The crowd was all filled with awe and praise God and said this, a great prophet, there's that word, has appeared among us. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Did you hear the word faith? It's not a trick question. I already told you in the very beginning before I read that, you're not going, it's, okay, so here we go. You have to imagine the scene. 
this widow is filled with despair. She has no husband. We would have known that. She now has no son. And she is heading outside of the city, moving away from everything that she ever had in order to bury her son. She is distraught. She is despondent. She is despairing. She is filled with dread because to be a single or to be a widow in that culture and society meant that you had nobody to stand with you. She is filled with emptiness and wailing and weeping along with the crowd. She is headed out, but who is headed in to the city? Did you notice that? Jesus. It's, it's, this, it's this kind of striking contrast of her weeping and leaving and basically leaving everything behind as Jesus walks in with his disciples in this crowd and they are excited and they are enthusiastic because they have seen the work that Jesus is doing, the healing that he is bringing, the proclamation that is happening. And so there's this sense of excitement and wonder. And then there's just this complete, they run into each other. And Jesus looks at her. And he has compassion. And he says, do not weep. And he touches the stretcher, the beer. And her son is raised to life. Jesus says, get up. Now, you may recall a similar story in 1 Kings 17 with the prophet Elijah. So it is interesting that Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. But in 1 Kings 17, the widow at Zarephath, you may recall her son dies, and Elijah says, your son will live. And she says, I don't think that's going to happen. And Elijah goes in and throws himself on the son three different times and then says, get up, and the son is raised to new life, resurrected. But Jesus doesn't even have to touch this man. He simply speaks. Get up. I have come to bring life, and as Keith reminded us, life abundant. But Jesus doesn't simply speak. He brings forth his word. Now, When I think about a story of grace and mercy, I look at this raising of this woman's son. Because there is healing and restoration, and yet how many words does she speak to Jesus? Where is the faith? Where's the, where's the story of faith that we want to hear about that, that, you know, this woman had great faith. She was like the centurion and in the midst of her weeping, in the midst of her wailing, in the midst of her crying, as the way on her way out of town, she talks to Jesus and says, Hey, I have this faith and could you possibly raise? There is none of that. Please notice this and do not miss that. What is the gift of God's grace? What is the gift of God's mercy? It is a word of hope and salvation that comes to us, perhaps even when we don't even know what to say. We don't know how to articulate it. We are so broken. We are so much in despair. We are just grieving whatever it is that is happening in and in the midst of our lives. And we are walking away from everything. And guess who meets us? Jesus. We're headed out of town. We've got nothing left. And this humble man, this teacher, this preacher, this prophet stops in front of us and says, don't cry. All will be well. And the child, the son, is healed. You see, I think that's our story sometimes. We've had enough. We're not understanding. Life is not making sense. 
and we simply want to just leave town, shut the door, walk away, because there's nothing left for us, we sense. And what I want to remind you of is there is one who promises to meet you, no matter where you are, no matter what you have done, no matter whether you can even proclaim the name of Jesus or trust in the name of Jesus. The promise of this word is that he comes for us and he longs to be in relationship with us, with you. Nothing you have done, nothing that has happened around you can separate you from the great love that God has for you in and through Jesus Christ. The only person, and may, I may be stretching this a little bit, but the preacher's prerogative to do this, right? The only person in this narrative that has faith that we, I think we see is Jesus. And my friends, that is enough. Okay? I want you to hear that very clearly this morning that it is the faithfulness and the goodness of Jesus that sees you where you are and says, don't weep, don't cry, don't get down on yourself, don't whatever it is, whatever that, whatever that drama issue, problem, dilemma that you are in, Jesus is saying, I want to meet you. Because that's what the promise is. And if you notice the crowd, people aren't just raised from the dead. Like that is just not a normal occurrence. Right? Like, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. And they're like, there's a prophet in our midst. The Lord has paid us a visit. This is what God does. The Lord will gladly pay you a visit. He pauses and he speaks and he says, be healed, be restored, be reconciled. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of why we proclaim the message when Moses said, hey, someone's coming after me who's way you know, way bigger and way better and way everything else than me. You need to listen to him. And then that person arrives in Jesus and there is this celebration of the crowd. There is this doxology. It's like the choir all of a sudden going to this great praise of the living God because God has done it. That was the end of the Psalm this morning. Y'all remember that? Just say like the call to worship. He's done it. Like that, that's how that psalm ended. And I think it's a great word. Like in the midst of all this, God has done it. The apostle Paul, I've got to make one more comment about prophets because I don't want us to miss this. This is brief and it's a doxology and it's the apostle Paul's praise to the living God about the prophetic word being revealed and fulfilled and sustained and seen in Jesus Christ as he wraps up this incredible letter to the church at Rome with this deep theology and this deep understanding of how God works his ways out amongst the Jewish believers and the Christian believers and the Gentile believers and all of this. He says this, this is Romans 16 verses 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel. Oh, did I start? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. That's the prophetic message. That message has been hidden from long ages past. He continues on, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you hear the crescendo of the apostle Paul's voice as he says, God has done it. He has spoken through the prophetic, the prophets. He has brought the savior. He has accomplished what he said he was going to do. And it is good, and it is glorious, and it is beautiful, and we want to jump up and celebrate that the living God is in our midst. And then I want you to know what happens right after this story of the widow of nine. Her son has been raised to new life. The crowd is praising the living God. This is the joy, triumphant. This is the stuff we live for. And then literally, the next verse Okay, we looked at Luke 7, 11 through 17. Guess what happens in Luke chapter 7, verse 18. We encounter John the Baptist. Y'all remember John the Baptist? Baptized Jesus, right? The cousin of Jesus. John the Baptist finds himself in prison. 
He's questioning this whole thing. We have just had this incredible moment of faith where the whole crowd has said, God has shown up. God has brought a prophet our way. And literally the next verse, because isn't this the way life works? We are riding on cloud high, cloud high, cloud high. Is that right? That just doesn't sound right. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? We've had this moment of God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy, and we are fired up. And then we read this. John's disciples told him about all these things that Jesus was doing, calling two of them. This is verse 18. John sent them to the Lord to ask this question. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? What? Literally the next verse? Continuing on. When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, the words from Isaiah, by the way, that he's going to say right here, the prophet, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You heard that earlier, right? This is Jesus when he reads from Isaiah, gives himself his own commission. He says, this is what I'm doing. And then he ends with this, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. <laughs> like we couldn't even have five verses between like this celebration and all of a sudden, guess what happens? Doubt enters in. Because this is the story of our lives. You have John the Baptist who leapt in his mother's womb when his mother was with Mary and baby Jesus, right? Who somehow baptized Jesus, and yet a couple years later, he's asking this question. He's filled with doubt. And I, I'm, always, I'm always a little, when people just say to me, I don't have any doubts about my faith. Hmm. I'm impressed. They must have the gift of faith because most people I know have doubts. And if you have doubts, you are in good company. I can read you Genesis through Revelation and you will be in great company with a lot of the saints and sinners who have gone before us who still had their doubts. But John the Baptist is sitting there and he's like, come on, cousin, like, let's figure this out. Because John was expecting a different Messiah. John was expecting his cousin to come in power and glory, but in a different power and a different glory. He was expecting him to restore Israel to the nation that it once was. We have our doubts. Paul Tillich said, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It is an element of faith. And I think if we're honest, it's true. It's not the opposite. To have doubts does not mean, and hear this very clearly, to have doubts does not mean that you don't have faith. To have doubts is simply to be human. It is not the opposite. It does not disqualify your faith. But John has his questions. And so Jesus says to his disciples, well, go back and tell him what you're seeing. Go back and tell him what you're hearing Because what is Jesus doing? Where, where, let me put it this way. Where is Jesus to be found? It's not in Rome. Interesting to me, Jesus never ran for public office, never went to Rome, never took on the city leaders, really. But he said, Do you know why I've come? To be with the sick, to be with the oppressed, to be with the poor and to be with the outcast. And so he's saying to John the Baptist, if you want to find me, that's where I'm going to be with the least of these. Not in the courts, not in the politics. I'm going to be with the least of these. If you want to find me, that's where I am. But there's this, this is the last point here. There's this question that John asks, are you the one? Or should I look for someone else? 
I think that's always an important question to ask ourselves. Is Christ really the one in our lives? The one. Everyone has a one. Believer, non-believer, agnostic, atheist, I don't care what you are, there's always the one. Something that you give your life to. Is Jesus the one for us? Because when he's not, that's when the doubts begin and the questions happen. But I want to let you know something. Jesus can handle your doubts. He didn't get on John the Baptist's case for his doubts. Notice that. He didn't say, John, what is wrong with you and why do you doubt? Right? I mean, if anybody was not going to doubt, I think it would be John the Baptist. But he didn't say that. He said, just look and see what I'm doing. See the healing and restoration that I am bringing. Don't toss it all out because I'm different than who you think I am. Keep the faith. So wrapping up. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's happening in your life, what's going good, what's going bad, whether you're like, I'm ready to chuck it all. I'm so sick of whatever it is. I want to encourage you that Jesus is walking toward you. that Jesus longs to be in the middle of your life. God with us, Emmanuel. He wants to offer you that prophetic word of hope and grace and mercy. Jesus is moving toward you. And the question is, will you trust him? Will you bring your doubts to him? Will you bring your despair to him? Will you bring your uncertainty to him? And recognize that he is big enough to carry it all. And he wants to speak a word of hope and healing over your life. Pray with me, please. Oh God, in Christ, we do encounter the ultimate prophet. The one of whom Moses spoke. The one who would be raised up, Lord, not just to life, but to everlasting life. But to do that, he had to be raised up on the cross. Lord, we come with doubts, we come with despair, we come with uncertainty, we come with questions. May we see that in Jesus Christ we encounter one who is big enough to handle all of that. And we meet the one who simply wants to speak a word of hope and peace and encouragement over our lives. Give us faith to trust in you, O Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.